Your friends are scrolling through short content, but you, my friend, you're here to learn. Welcome to Tiara's Clips. Let's talk about astronomy and ah, okay, uh, all right. You know right. the sciences right. a little more. Right, right. Uh, what would you like to say about it? Okay. Would you like to bring so, in astrology as well? There is no such thing as astrology. We only had Jyotisha. We only had Jyotisha, which is intricate observation of the skies with mathematics, understanding movement of the heavenly bodies and other such things. Indians were intellectually so curious, they have tried just about everything. So even in astronomy, they have tried to see how can I understand movements of the heavenly skies and peg it to life on Earth. As the cosmos, so in the microcosm also, right? They have tried ideas of this nature. People have tried to see cycles in nature, cycles in life. You know, we go through our night and day cycles and things of that where nature. Where is all this? Where is all this? What do you mean? Like where have they written these things about uh, whatever's up there is also down here? It's th th this has been the recurrent theme throughout uh, Indian uh, um, uh, writings and history, if, if you will. So throughout it has been that they look to the skies for inspiration and so also below over here, as in the sky, in the cosmos, so over here. This is a recurrent theme. Wherever you see, this, this is the kind of theme that happens. And uh, so so, so if, if you want to talk about Indian astronomy itself, we have to go to pretty ancient times. Initially, Indians observed the heavenly bodies, all the movement of the heavenly bodies and so on. And they tried to make sense of it. They tried to remember it. And they evolved that into stories. They made a bunch of stories about it. So encoding of wisdom into stories. One such story, early story, was Chandra married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. So that is the story that they made and promptly sent a whole lot of people tittering to laughter, saying, what nonsense, Chandra is anthropomorphic, uh, the moon, there's no such thing. He's, a, he's not a man. And how can he marry 27 women? But the point is, it concealed a wisdom which people intended to convey. Every day our ancestors observed the moon would rise in the eastern horizon at a slightly different time. And if it is evening time, you can make out what is a star in the background, right? So if today it rises at 8 p.m., tomorrow it might rise at 8.40, right? Some sometime offset is over there. And therefore, it is against a different backdrop of stars every day. And they notice it takes 27 days approximately for the moon to come back to the same backdrop of stars. So they divided the entire ecliptic into 27 segments. And it's not enough to just divide it, right? You should also recognize it. So they tried to see what is the principal brightest star in each of these 27 segments. And they gave it a name. And mnemonic was the wives of the moon. By knowing the stories of the nakshatras, I might be able to tell you what will follow what, what will follow what. In other words, you have an intricate and map of the skies through stories. The stories tell you what's going to come next and so on. So Indians could mark the passage of time merely by looking at where is the moon against which backdrop of star is that. Each of these segments is called a nakshatra. So it is presumed that moon would visit one wife each day a lunar mansion, if you will. Like, for example, at 10 o'clock today, if the moon is somewhere over there in the sky, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you go and see where the moon is, it'll have fallen behind by 13 and one-third degrees. Mm. So this is the understanding. In a 24-hour period, it covers 13 and one-third degrees. So this is what our ancestors did. They initially observed these cycles, encoded them into stories. So this is one such story. The story says that Chandra loved Rohini more than the others one of the wives, and his father-in-law, Daksha, got furious with him. How can you treat my daughters unequally and so on? He curses him, you're going to die. Chandra doesn't want to die. He runs out to Mahadeva, please, Mahadeva, I don't want to die. Mahadeva says, I can't remove the curse, but I'll alleviate it. As you die, eventually you'll grow in strength once again, and once again you'll fade away and die. So this part of the story is remembering the phases of the moon. So the moon goes from Amavasya to Pournami back to Amavasya. It takes 29.5 days approximately to do that. So Indians clearly understood that we had a sidereal month, which is 27 days, a nakshatra-based model, and a 29.5 day synodic month based on the tithi of the moon and so on. And they also understood Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. It means the movement of the moon northwards takes six months, and the movement of the moon southwards, which takes another six months. In this peregrination, the moon goes from 23.3 degrees to the north, 
all the way to minus 23.3 degrees of the south. When it goes to the southernmost point, we have winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. So they understood the duration of the year in addition by looking at this phenomena. And it was 365.24 days. So began intellectual developments in India. They do, you, what, do you know the book's name or wherever all these records are kept? These are, for example, in the Puranas. The Matsya Purana talks about Chandra marrying the 27 daughters of King Daksha, God. about the story of Mahadeva, about uh, faith, cursing, all of these kind of things. Uttrayana, Dakshinayana stories come through. Uh, for example, there are stories that encode even this phenomena, uh, uh, Uttrayana, Dakshinayana and so on. That in various Puranas we find these stories. So uh, they try to reconcile the various calendars that I have a solar uh, 365.24 days. I've got a synodic month, 29.5 days. I've got a sidereal month, 27.3 days. So they had to fi figure out some synchrony between these things to make sense out of it. Initially, Rig Veda said that uh, the year consists of 360 days. One might wonder, what about the remaining uh, 5.24 days? Well, Professor Abhyankar says that they used to have an Atiratra sacrifice in the ancient days when they don't count the passage of time in those five days. They do the yajna at that time and it comes back into sync. Then later on in Atharva Veda itself, it says the Rishi called Rohita, he created the Adhikamasa. Adhikamasa is an intercalary month which you insert into the calendar so that you'll have synchrony between uh, the, the, the lunar and the solar calendar. You'll have synchrony every two, three years. You'll average out to 365.24 days. And the Rishi called Rohita was the one who mathematically figured out what was the way to do it. So we have evidence of these kind of things. Indians were great observers of the skies, trying to impose mathematics on it, trying to get this intellectual fulfillment by trying to reconcile the cycles. All the yoga models that we have, they're all intellectual outgrowths of the synchronizations that we're talking about. So all these things were done. Then we got in the Rig Veda itself, so much of astronomy, various kinds of astronomy. And one of them, it is talking about uh, the Rishi Atri. Rishi Atri is supposed to have observed a solar eclipse. You'll say big deal, right? I mean, everybody observes solar eclipse. Why would you mention Rishi Atri over there? But the fact is, Balakangadhar Tilak, he translated what was then the Rig Veda, and he said that uh, Atri made use of a device called Thuriya Yantra. A Thuriya Yantra, he translated to approximately a quadrant. A quadrant is like a protractor, right? You measure angles with it. And you might wonder, what on earth? Why would he use that, right? Well, we know that uh, from, at least from Aryabhata's work onwards, if you take the plane of the sun called the ecliptic, it appears the sun is going around the earth, right? So that plane is called the ecliptic. The path of the moon is offset by five degrees. As in? The path, the path of the moon, how the moon goes around the earth is offset by five degrees, the geometry. I'm talking about the geometry now compared to the plane, plane of, of the, the sun. sun. Okay. Because of that, eclipses can only happen when these two planes coincide. Hmm. On one side, a solar eclipse can happen. On the other side, a lunar eclipse can hmm. happen. And Aryabhata has explained this beautifully and is calling this as Rahu and this as Ketu. So this whole business of Rahu and Ketu is explained by Aryabhata using the mathematics, showing when an eclipse can happen. Now, if you want to predict an eclipse, you've got to know the angle between sun and moon. As that angle is coming closer and closer to zero, you can predict an eclipse is going to happen. So it looks like Rishi Atri had this device, which is the Thuriya Yantra, like a, a quadrant kind of device, which obviously measures angles in the sky. He's used that to predict when an eclipse would happen. This is fantastic. It's fantastic because today there are some who are saying uh, Rishi Atri's eclipse is dated to 4750 BCE. Some other says, if that is not the one, there's one more in 4202 BCE. These are the kind of time frames that Atri should be uh, uh, dated to on this eclipse information. This means in that time frame, this Rishi has already understood there's an angular relationship between the sun and the moon based on which I can predict when an eclipse will happen. So you have understood the phenomena, you know how to measure it, and you know how to predict it. That is how he's remembered in the Rig Veda.
that Rishi Atri was able to predict this. So I find this mind-blowing that at a, such an early period of time, Indians had understood the phenomena, the mathematics, predictive capability, and things of this nature. So this is not only one, uh, Ranveer. There's so many instances in the Indian astronomy that typically blows my mind. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out this playlist for more videos just like this. It's TRS Clips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.